well until like June. Yeah. So we'll see. I think we're at more of a bigger concern is we'll be falling. Yeah. Seen it all. So Hannah, when you work Saturdays, is it like a twelve hour shift? Or? It's about to be guys to do. at some point. What's that? Once, yeah, once the baby gets a little older, we will, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Luke Presbyterian Church. It's a good, good morning to be with you in worship, and I'm so thankful for the little cooler weather and thankful for the wind and the breeze that's blowing. Uh, I, I'm talking to our live stream now. I hope that the wind won't blow the phone over, uh, but if it does, we'll have someone on it. we got people, people on the ground <laughs> prepared to rescue. So welcome again, and welcome to worship so good to see you. If you are new, my name is Pastor Luke. I'd love to connect with you, so stick around. You can also connect with us on our website. We have an online connection card there, but feel free uh, to get in touch. We want to uh, support you and support our community uh, for the glory of God as best we can. We have uh, several announcements this morning. You might be wondering uh, the shirt that I'm wearing and Pat and Debbie and others uh, that says the church, Julia, the church has left the building. It's these these shirts, and this is actually kind of a new community movement uh, that's going on between the partnership of our church and several other local churches in the area. God's doing a really great thing here in the Northland, and today we're having our first ever The Church Has Left the Building uh, event, and it's going to be at 1 p.m., really kind of just after our service today, we're going to begin meeting at the Northland Fountains over there on North Oak and Vivian. You probably know where they are. It's a big fountain right there. Um, and so we're real excited. It's right there by kind of where the seminary is at. But we're going to just be getting there, and we're going to gather around the fountain. Be sure to wear your masks. Well, there's enough room for us to kind of spread out. There'll be several other churches there as well. But we're just going to pray together. We're going to pray and worship and lift our hands to the Lord. I think it's going to be a really key thing for us as the church to continue to become more and more unified and to become unified in our communities in terms of outreach and how we can reach others and break down dividing walls. Because God is at work and he's moving. So if you have the time today, please just come and pray with us. Let's just swarm the area so that the whole uh, Northland area can see just a, what are all those people doing out by the fountain? Well, the church has left the building. We're praying. We're, we're on the go. There's hope. God is alive. Jesus is alive. He's on his throne. 
And so we're, we're excited to share that with our community. And just a couple of things you can see in your bulletin. I won't go through all of them, but we do starting next week. Um, the session uh, met on Monday, and we believed it was still best after talking with many of you that we uh, continue to meet outside through September, uh, which is a good thing because the weather is starting to get a lot nicer. So we decided to lean into that, and hopefully we'll be getting we'll, we'll be getting back in the building in October as things start to get a little too cold. Um, but there is hope. Uh, we're beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But at the same time, this has been such a godsend that we have been able to meet like this, and God has provided for us. So just thank you so much for being flexible in that regard and keeping one another safe. We were talking as a session. You know, we have very, we've had very few people actually get the virus, and so I think that is a is a good reminder as to why you know taking things safe is so important. But there are we're actually are going to be entering the building with Bible studies next week. There are two options in the morning for you, and the sign-ups are currently on our website right now. We'd love for you to RSVP to those, but there's the Knowing God Bible Study. That's both a men and women's study, anyone who wants to be a part of it. Uh, we have, do have books on sale, so if you want one, please contact me. And then the women's class is also starting, the Mary class, and they're going to be going through First and Second Peter at 9 a.m., so I encourage you to be a part of that. A sign up online as well that helps give us an idea and then there is going to be a men's study I'm looking at you all men I'm gonna come after you one-on-one -on -one. I'm encouraging you to come to this study it's a man in the mirror Bible study that starts in October in about a month that'll be on Tuesday nights at 7 we can change the schedule that's just what we'll start with for now but please sign up for that um, and that's a great thing men to invite other men that might be your friends or neighbors that might never have attended the church to come be a part of that because men we need to lead we need to take we need to take control of some things in our household it says that statistics show that when men start going to church the family almost 99 percent of the time starts coming to the church as well so men's ministry is something we need to continue to focus on and then there'll be a prayer walk at penguin park on september 10th 6 30 i believe that's a thursday night so really we're going to meet here in the parking lot we're going to walk over there and pray over the park and the people and the that are uh, playing there. So many, many things going on. Please mark your calendar, get involved, um, and thank you so much for your continual support. That being said, let's pray and go to worship. Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful weather. Lord, thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. And Lord God, thank you for the joy that your spirit gives and the peace that your spirit gives and the hope that we have in Jesus, your Son. Lord God, may the cross be high and lifted up. Lord, may it be all that we see. May there be less of us, completely less of us, and more of you. Lord, may your praises be heard, and may they be glorifying, and may they make much of you and who you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Please join me as we reaffirm our mission and our vision for this church. What is the mission of our church? Our, our mission, mission is, is to know Christ, becoming like him for the glory of God. God. What is the vision of our church? Our, our vision is to be a church to our community that preaches the good news of Jesus Christ, serves the needs of our neighbors, and empowers disciples to make disciples. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot for, from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur, a scorching wind will be their lot. For the, the Lord, Lord is righteous, he loves justice, 
the upright will see his face. Our God is a righteous king. And without the Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus, we stand before him undone with nothing. And therefore, all we can do is worship and respond in faith and receive what he's done for us. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to be every part of what we're doing this morning and to lead it. Let's sing the song together. Thank you, God. 
God, thank you for your presence here with us, Lord. May it continue to stir and move and hover over this place. Create new life in us, God, like you did on the day of creation. Revive us, Lord. Refresh us. We love you, God. Let us now um, reaffirm what we believe from the New City Catechism. This is question number 11. What does God require in the 6th, 7th, and 8th commandments? 6th, that, that we do, do not, not hurt or, or hate or be hostile to our neighbor, but be patient and peaceful, pursuing even our enemies with love. 7th, that we abstain from sexual immorality and live purely and faithfully, whether in marriage or in single life, avoiding all impure actions, looks, words, thoughts, or desires, and whatever might lead to them. Eighth, that we do not take without permission that which belongs to someone else nor withhold any good from someone we might benefit. Amen. Let's now, beloved, after hearing those commands from our Lord, confess our sins to Him. It's such a wonderful thing to confess our sins, not only personally, but corporately as a church. And Jesus Christ, in His last few words to the church, said this in Revelation 3. To whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Let me say that again. To whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Let's take a silent moment of confession. Open your hearts to Jesus. Lord God, we need your forgiveness. And we know the scripture says it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And Lord God, we say with the psalmist, King David, as he said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They comfort us, Lord. Thank you for keeping us on the path of righteousness. Thank you for protecting us, Lord, from those who long to cause us harm protecting us from ourselves and from our sin. Lord, continue to guide us with your staff. And Lord God, we ask that the blood of Jesus would cover this place. Lord God, we do ask for forgiveness, even as a church, Lord, how we have corporately gone against your ways. Continue to set us straight in the name and the power of Jesus. Amen. And I, beloved, hear the assurance, the assurance, the blessed assurance of your forgiveness from Psalm 130, 3 through 5. If you, O oh Lord, kept a record of sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. With you, that's Yahweh, beloved. Therefore, you are feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits in his word. I put my hope. Amen. We're now going to sing a song called Majesty. It might be new to you, but it's a wonderful song, very easy to sing in regards to where we're going with our scripture passage today, which is the transfiguration. And this is true for all who have put their hope in Jesus. Hear these words. It says, here I am humbled by the love that you give, forgiveness so that I can forgive. Here I stand knowing that I am your desire, sanctified, beloved, by glory and fire. It's also at this time that we will take our morning offering. So if you do have an offering, don't feel pressured to give, particularly if you're new. 
just as the Lord leads you, but just wave your hand and one of our deacons will come to you. We thank you for supporting us, particularly during this difficult time.
pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning and we give you all the glory. We give you every room, Lord. We give you every inch of our hearts. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts that we may see as you see, that we may hear as you hear, and we may love as you love. Lord God, reveal your good word to us today. Lord, may it be truly from you. Get this pastor out of the way, Lord. Get any, any of these, any people, Lord, get us out of the way that you may be on full display. Lord, continue to humble us, humble this church, transform this church, change this church continuously more and more to look like the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord God, we pray for our community where you have planted us, where you have established us. Lord, we recognize that our address is no accident. Lord, you have placed us here for a reason. And Lord God, we respond to that completely. We respond to whatever you are doing. And we ask that you would show us, God, where you're already at work and how we can join you. Lord, we know you're at work all around us. Your people are in the field. Your remnant, Lord, is here. And we ask, Lord, that you would just simply reveal yourself and what you're doing, and Lord, and use us as servants, God. We are jealous for what you're doing in the world, God. We want to be a part of it. Lord God, if it be within your good and perfect will, use us, Father, beyond just ourselves. And bring salvation, God, to this area. Bring salvation to the Northland. Bring salvation to Glenhaven. And bring salvation, Lord, to the hearts of those who may even be in this congregation who still do not know you. Do not know you for who you really are. Maybe have an image and a form of who you are, but do not see you clearly. Lord God, we pray that you would reach out to them today. And today would be the day. And Lord God, we're praying for many in our congregation. For Pat Pearl, continuously for her health. For Phyllis Carr Pierce, Lord, be with her. Lord, bring friends continuously to her side. Lord, be with Dwight Sampson. Be with his family. Lord, be with him, Lord, and his pain and his, and his legs. And Lord God, we pray for Amber Quinn and for their family. Lord, we thank you for a successful surgery, Lord God, and we just pray that you continue to heal her and be with her and her children and her husband, Lord God. Lord, we also pray for protection and courage and peace for our, our military and our healthcare workers and all of our public servants, police officers and firefighters and social workers, Lord, there are so many out there, Lord, on the front lines who need your protection, peace, and wisdom, Lord God. We ask that you would be with them and their families. Lord God, I pray for Russ Staves and Gary Staves, Lord. Pray that he would continue to be healed. Lord, we pray for Pam Payne this morning, her brother Max, who's fighting this virus. Lord God, heal him in the name of Jesus. Lord, may he feel your spirit right now over him. Lord, give Pam courage and peace, Lord, in this battle. We pray continuously for Mark Hughes, Lord, and for Joe Palacatile, and for Cliff, Lord, and all who have served this church in the recent years. God, guide them and be with them. Encourage them be with their churches. May your word be preached faithfully. And we pray for Marsha and Bob Bush, and their daughter Peggy, and all their children, Lord. Continue to heal them, bring comfort. And God, we also continue to pray for Dodie Rail and Rich. Lord, in the name of Jesus, take her pain away. And continue to show your will to them and, and give Rich encouragement and strength and energy. And God, today we also pray for the Kral family. We thank you for again for the life of John. And Lord, we pray for comfort for Sue and for the whole family. Lord, may she feel your presence so close. Thank you for what you've done in John's life. We continue to pray for Darlene Lewis, Lord, for healing. And for John Sullivan right now, Lord, as he's in Rochester. Lord, heal him in the name of Jesus. Protect him. Thank you for watching over him, Lord. Thank you for truly snatching him from death. Be with Cass. Give her support and encouragement. Lord God, be with Debbie and Kent Blackman and Kenny. Continue to heal him, Lord. Give them strength. 
Be with Beth and Gary Burns, Lord. Continue to strengthen them. Save Gary, Lord. Reach out to Gary, Lord. Snatch him up. May your Holy Spirit just hover in a heavy, heavy way over their home. Pray for Don and Jan. Lord God, thank you for giving Jan a date to continue to have back healing. Lord, may she have complete healing in the name of Jesus, God. We ask you as your children. She suffered for so long and for Don as well, God. Give him clarity and wisdom and strength. We continue to pray for Barb and Kevin Kelly as they still struggle with some symptoms. God, be with them. Be with Mary Schrack and their daughter Carrie and their family. And the mother-in-law, Kathy, Lord, as she's recovering from the virus. Lord, continue to watch over Mary. We're so thankful for her leadership. And Lord God, there are so many things and more, Lord, that we are praying for. You know them all. You know their names. And Lord God, we thank you for the prayer that you gave us from Jesus Christ, your Son, who said these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, beloved, um, just a quick announcement. This is actually going to be our last week in Mark for the time being. Because starting next week, this is a great place to kind of, this is a good midpoint Mark for us to take a pause. But starting next week, we're going to be doing an, a nine-week study through Nehemiah in the Old Testament, through Nehemiah. And I am pumped up like no other to go through Nehemiah with you. Um, particularly as we begin some of these town halls. As you know, we're going to have two town halls in September, October, November, and December as we begin to talk about how we're going to be in this rebuilding process with our church. And that's all that Nehemiah is about. Nehemiah, as you know, he was uh, sent back with the exiles to rebuild Jerusalem after they had been exiled and taken over by Babylon. And so we've been studying it a little bit with staff earlier in the year, and we've been studying it a little bit in this session and it's such a powerful, encouraging book on leadership and how we need it, how we're all a team and how the team has each part to play. So I'm just really encouraged with that. So be looking forward to that. Be prepared. Go ahead and read ahead if you like. I think that's always helpful. Get a little idea of what's going on there. But excited to go into Nehemiah with you. So today's our last day in Mark until we finish with Nehemiah, then we'll get back to it. But like I said, this is a great place to kind of to pause. We're in Mark 9. The beginning of Mark 9, verses 1 through 13. This is kind of the climax before the ultimate climax of the cross. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. And there's a lot going on here. So if you have ability to take notes, I really, really encourage it today. Because there's a lot to be had. And please come to the open table. Because you're just not going to get it completely unless you can get in a group and rehash this. So if you're needing help as well, your computer phone. If you want to join up a table where you just don't know how or you're worried about it, please call the office. I'd be glad to help walk you through it. And uh, I think that's super, super important. Anyone who is concerned with their computer at all, maybe they don't have a computer and they can just call in. Call us. We'll help you. That's Wednesday nights at 6. Soon to be back in the building. Mark 9, 1 through 13. Let's open up there, beloved. Hear the word of the Lord. And Jesus said to them, that's the disciples. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here now will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became a dazzling white wider than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 
And the text says, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Hear him. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone except Jesus. And they were coming down the mountain. Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what, what does rising from the dead mean? And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it was written about him. The word of the Lord. So our passage today is commonly referred to throughout Christian history as the Transfiguration. Like I said, we could spend a whole year on the significance, the context, prophecies, and meaning packed into these 13 verses. A lot is going on. If we remember from last time, Jesus is at the base of Caesarea Philippi, 25 miles straight north of the Sea of Galilee. This is all a continuation, essentially, of the conversation they just had with Peter, where Peter declared that he is the Christ, and then tries to get in the way of Christ's plan about going to the cross. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you do not have the ideas of God, but the ideas of man. And then it says, immediately after that, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. Now there's a lot we can go into there. There's a lot of different reasons why Jesus might have said that. First of all, he could, Mark, as we know, tends to write his gospel in parallel, but also with things immediately following, kind of comment on the things immediately before. And so Mark could very clearly be talking about what's about to happen on the Transfiguration, but he also could have been talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, where we know that many of the disciples had already been martyred, but some had not, particularly John. And that destruction that happened in Jerusalem by the Romans really put an end to the, the, the old covenant age and the ability to sacrifice in the temple and ushered in this new kingdom. So there's many things we could go into there, but today we're really going to focus on verse 7. Like I said, there's a lot, so keep writing questions. Verse 7 says this, And a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Hear him. Hear him. So that's the title of today's sermon. Hear him. I believe this passage... And this word from the Lord here is the focal point reason behind the transfiguration. But first, for us to understand that clearly, we need to kind of do a big loop in understanding, once again, the geographical, spiritual, and prophetic context. Some of the following information that I'm about to say might seem a bit strange. It might seem a bit out there, but I promise you it's not. I'm not making any of it up. The following background context is orthodox thought. It's pretty well studied, and, I, and I'm very indebted today to my seminary Hebrew professor, Dr. Michael Heiser, and his work, Reversing Hermon in the Unseen Realm, which I encourage you to look into. It's Michael Heiser, Reversing Hermon in the Unseen Realm. He's done a lot of research on the geography behind these topics. So we learned last time that the disciples and Jesus were near Caesarea Philippi at the base of Mount Hermon. This area in the days of Jesus was covered with pagan shrines and worship, as we know, one of them being to Pan. For the Jews, it was known as the gateway to hell, the Grotto of Pan, Old Testament times. Even going further back, this area was called Bashan, or the place of the serpent, the place of the serpent. So why that name? Why does this area just seem to be covered in pagan ideas? Well, there's a few telling reasons. We have to go back, though, to Genesis chapter 6. Way back. <laughs> in Genesis 6, we see some of the oddest passages in the whole Bible. Verses 1 through 8 tell us, The sons of God, who saw the daughters of men, and decided to come down to earth to have sexual relations with them. 
Out of this transgression and rebellion came the Nephilim, the Nephilim, who were understood to be giants. The, the word says that they were heroes of old, men of renown. It's primarily for this transgression, Genesis 6. This is the precursor to the flood story with Noah. So Genesis 6 talks about in this time, things got really out of hand. They got really wicked. And the sons of God came down and had relations with the daughters of men. And out of that relationship came the Nephilim. And it says that this is one of the reasons why the Lord decided to send a flood and destroy the whole earth and start over with Noah. In Jewish tradition, the sons of God are understood to be divine beings, angels, every time they're mentioned. The devil was not the only divine being to rebel against God. It appears that in Genesis 6, a group of angels following in the same path as the divine rebel of the garden decided to interfere with God's image bearers. We see that even in the New Testament, this understanding was known by the authors. For example, in the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 6, Jude says this, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, has, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Second Peter 2, 4 says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And then Revelation 12, 9 comments on those episodes is when he's talking about the devil. It says that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So not just one person, but there was a group of divine rebels known as the sons of God. One has to, well, all angels are known usually as the sons of God. One has to ask, where are the New Testament writers getting that information? Where do we see that in our Bible? Genesis 6 is not completely exact. What Old Testament scripture were they drawing from? Well, Jude and Peter were directly quoting from a non-canonical, that means not in our Bibles today, manuscript called the Book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is said to have been written by Enoch, who is mentioned in Genesis 4, verse 17, as the one swept off into heaven without dying, who's the great-grandfather of Noah. The book is written as Enoch's first-hand account of going into heaven and learning more about divine realms and things of this nature, and there's a lot of information about the divine rebels here. Enoch tells us a detailed information about the devil, the fallen angels, the Nephilim, and God's coming judgment. Most scholars believe that the book was put together in the intertestamental period, which was between the Old and New Testaments, and is known as a second temple piece of literature. So second temple, when I say that, it means when Nehemiah came back and Ezra, and they rebuilt God's temple after exile, there was another uh, time where the Jews began to write more literature and put things together, and that's called second temple literature. For many Jews at the time of Jesus, just 200 years or so afterwards, the book of Enoch was viewed as canon and authoritative. Much in terms of manuscripts was not known about the book of Enoch in the era of the early church. Therefore, it is not considered today a part of inspired piece of the canon of our Christian Bibles. And I don't, I don't believe that either. I believe that our Bible was put together for a reason. But it can be seen as an essential piece of second-hand context for understanding how the Jews see things, saw things during the time of Jesus, some of their thought and their influence. With the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, you might have heard of that, which was a bunch of manuscripts that really showed, they're old, old manuscripts of the Bible that showed that the Bible has really been untouched with time, has not been perverted or changed, which is a miracle in itself. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947, much more had been learned about this ancient book. It was far more accepted and protected over the years than we initially had thought. Therefore, why do I bring this up? I do believe it's a reliable secondary source, but must be taken with a grain of salt. In the book of Enoch, it says this, and this is helpful for our context, because we know that Peter, they knew this. In the book of Enoch, the divine rebellion that took place in Genesis 6, the landing spot of the fallen angels, was said to have taken place on Mount 
her mind. Enoch chapter 6 states, And they were in all 200 fallen angels who decided in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one. And they began to go into them and defile them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And they began, they began to make them pregnant. And they bore them great giants whose height was 3,000 L's who consumed all the acquisitions of men. Now that's some detail. Stick with me. It is almost as if the writers of Genesis assume the reader knows this information. Well, many Jews, including Peter, knew the facts from Enoch. It would have been, it would have been something that they had studied. You see, the Jews knew Mount Hermon, where Jesus is now standing at the base of, and the realm of Bashan, as ground zero for the devil's influence and works. The Hebrew Bible first mentions Bashan, this region in Numbers 21, where King Og of Bashan came out against the Israelites at the time of their entrance into the promised land, but was defeated in battle in Numbers 21 and Deuteronomy 3. Israel's scouts, when they're coming into the promised land, recognize this region as filled with giants, the sons of Anak. In Numbers 13, the Bible mentions in several places that King Og of Bashan was not a normal man, but was a giant whose bed alone was 13 feet long. And as Deuteronomy 3 and Amos 2.9 says, was as tall as the cedars. This area was not only known by the Jews as a place of giants, but also by all other Mesopotamian cultures. In Bashan, the epic of Gilgamesh takes place. Gilgamesh was said to be a giant. So therefore, below Satan, like his influence is literally in the DNA. Bashan was one of the areas that Yahweh disinherited after the scattering of Babel. As it says in Deuteronomy 32, remember the days of old, consider the generations long past. Ask your father and he will tell you. And ask your elders and they'll explain it to you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, and set up boundaries for the people according to the number of the sons of God. For the Lord's portion is his people, and Jacob's his allotted inheritance. So this is called the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, which talks about after the time of, of Babel, says right here in Deuteronomy, that Yahweh disinherited his people, and he gave them over, as Romans 1 says, to the influence, the demonic influence of the devil and the fallen angels. That's important for us to recognize. You see, the people of the earth were handed over to the influence of fallen angels, and Enoch tells us that they introduced all kinds of false worship, pagan worship, dark arts, all kinds of evil. Beloved, we best understand that there is much, much more than we can see or understand. The spiritual world is real. The Bible speaks all about it. It has much more influence and sway on the nations than we think. And there can be concentrated areas of demonic influence. This is very real. I know it may sound strange, but the Bible is clear. So God's redemptive plan begins to be played out as he selects his portion, his inheritance, the people of Israel, to reclaim the nations. That's what Mark is telling us a lot of the time with this Clint Eastwood style Jesus. He's reclaiming, kicking down doors, his people. Israel would be the people that the Messiah would come out of and the Messiah would reclaim all that is lost to him and he will crush the serpent's head, the place of the serpent, and bring salvation to the Gentiles. The conquest of Joshua in the Old Testament, many say that's extreme. Well, when you understand this context, what went on here, they were purging the land of demonic influence. Very demonic influence. If we go back and study any of the people groups of ancient Cana, it was dark. Yes, child sacrifice, which continues to be the devil's tool today in abortion. So let this influence continue, particularly in the region of Bashan and Mount Hermon. So are you with me? Our text today says Jesus, after six days, takes his inner circle up to the high mountain. Mark intentionally says six days. 
to parallel our story with Moses' story on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 24, it says, When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud of the glory of God settled on Mount Sinai for six days. Mark understands that the glory the disciples were to see was the same glory Moses beheld on Mount Sinai. Keep that in mind. What mountain, therefore, did Jesus take them up on? There's only one mountain in the area. There's only one high mountain and only one secluded mountain, and that mountain is Mount Hermon. There's no other plausible candidate. Mount Hermon is very high. It's the highest in the area, 9,000 feet. Any mountain in Galilee is more like a hill and would not have offered them any privacy. Most were fortified towns. For a long time, they thought that the Transfiguration Mountain was Mount Carmel, but that could not have been. It was completely fortified. Any mountain in Galilee is more like hills, as we said. So Mount Hermon also gives the climber a vast, if you've ever seen any video or picture of Mount Hermon, it's a beautiful mountain. It has this vast panoramic view of Israel stretching all the way down to the Mediterranean and to Jerusalem, where Jesus was about to be going next. It really showed in a physical way where they were headed. And so this is a defining moment. Mount Hermon is also, beloved, the likely most plausible location where Yahweh made his covenant with Abraham to give him the land. The nations. This fits the narrative because the promised land would have also been spread out in front of him. Could have seen it all as if God said, see the land I've spread out before you. How amazing is it that Jesus, the Messiah of God, the promised provision said to Abraham, Abraham, I'll provide, not your son, but mine, would stand in the same place as he begins to reclaim God's promised land. Jesus returns to the scene of the crime, ground zero of sin and rebellion. It's here that he reveals his glory. Jesus is physically transformed into his heavenly divine body. I'm not talking about just like he put on a white robe and, was, and washed his face. No, this was a complete transfiguration a metamorphosis is the word the angel of the lord so bright and brilliant the physical current and human limitations in our eyes for the disciples is pulled back and god himself is standing in all his brilliance before the disciples and before the demonic forces on their front step Spiritually speaking, this was a punch in the face to the devil. A let's get it on. Let's go. This was a victory charge. A deliberate act of war. With this reveal, the devil would have raged. And Jesus expedited his death. The devil knew he had to act. Only weeks later, beloved, Jesus would be on the cross. All according to plan. As it says, Paul said, if they'd only know that they had crucified the, the Lord of glory, they would not have done it. Moses and Elijah therefore appear, beloved. For the disciples, these two men were an author where they were as authoritative as it gets for Jews. Moses representing the holy law of God. Elijah representing all the work of the prophets. Moses was the current mouthpiece of God's law, still at that day. God spoke to the people through Moses and Elijah. But that was all about to change. Luke's gospel tells us that Moses and Elijah spoke with Jesus at his departure about the coming fulfillment, the place he was going in Jerusalem. They encouraged Jesus. For the disciples to see those men before Jesus would have been extraordinary and more assurance of his divine identity. Then the ultimate assurance of authority arrived, just like on Mount Sinai. A cloud of glory covered the summit, and God the Father spoke. This is my Son, whom I love. Hear Him. Hear Him. The disciples, they were terrified, and they responded with a theological reflex. They would build a tent to house this glory, just like the tabernacle. Yet they need not make a tabernacle for God. The tabernacle was among them in Jesus Christ. As John would later write in his gospel, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Notice in a flash, the clouds are gone. And so were Moses and Elijah. And all, it, says, it says in the text, all that was left was Jesus. 
But what do we have if we don't have Jesus? What the law was given to do and the prophets proclaimed was now fulfilled in Jesus. There's no longer a need for the law or the prophets as our direct authority. All had become one in the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The disciples wished to detain Moses and Elijah so they might hear him more. But God shows us that the law which had been in force and the prophets which had prophesied until now must all give place to Jesus. And he alone must now be attended to as the way, the truth, and the life. Huge moment for the disciples who are still struggling with this. God says, hear him. What could be more direct and more transparent for the disciples? The promised one of God was on the scene. As we saw in Deuteronomy 32, Yahweh will reclaim what is his. Now is that moment. No longer is there a need for a tabernacle or a prophet or a mediator. For as the book of Hebrews says, God himself will do that. Beloved, there's nothing more permanent and precious than the mediation of Jesus Christ. Where it says he sat down at the right hand of God after finishing his good work and now mediates with us through the spirit in groans we cannot understand. Everything else is in, in this world, beloved. This is so important because here is everything that the disciples knew and all of their influence in their history. And God himself says, listen to him. And then Moses, Elijah, they're taken away. The clouds are gone and it's just Jesus. Well, beloved, how true is that for us? Everything else in this world, beloved, will leave you. Nothing else stands forever but Jesus and his word. Everyone and everything. Other gods who had been their influence, they're gone. Your idols, it's gone. You don't have a luggage rack in heaven. It doesn't go with you. There's nothing else you can take or put your hope in. Your husband and wife, they can't be your idol. They can't be your God. They'll let you down. Everyone will eventually let you down. But Jesus will never let you down. When everything is taken away, when you lose everything, you still have the best thing. That's Jesus. Jesus always stands. Deuteronomy 32, in that worldview, it talks about how Yahweh is going to reclaim his nations. Well, it goes on to say this. The Lord will vindicate his people and relent concerning his servants when he sees their strength is gone. And no one is left, slave or free, he will say, now where are their gods? The rock they took refuge in, Mount Hermon, the gods who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings, let them rise up to help you. Let them give you shelter. See now that I myself am he. There is no other God besides me. What a statement. It's with this authority that Jesus can take the Passover feast and transform it to the communion table. It's with that authority that Jesus can proclaim the pouring out of a new covenant, N-E-W, new beloved, with his blood, with his sacrifice on the cross, eternal inheritance is offered to all people through faith. When the law and prophets pay homage and God the Father says, listen, we better listen. On this side of Easter, we no longer need to build a tabernacle or have a high priest to mediate or any other kind of priest. Christ has done that. As Hebrews 9.15 says, For this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, the one that Yahweh began to reclaim, beloved, at the very beginning. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from their sins committed under the first covenant. Church, do you see how marvelous the plan of God is today? Do you see all the fulfillment and majesty of the gospel story? You can't make this stuff up. You can't. Do you know that the glorified Christ is currently mediating, acting, and reigning on your behalf, on our behalf? Do you know that the evil one has been defeated? And we no longer belong to his inheritance. All he can do is rage. Do you know that you are of Abraham's seed through faith and therefore are inheriting a kingdom that can never spoil, perish, or fail? Are we listening to Jesus? There are thousands of pastors and 
politicians and whatever in the world right now who say, hear us. But the Father says, hear him. Many voices clamor for our attention. New philosophies, modern theologies, old heresies. They all call on us, but the Father says, hear him, my son, whom I love. Are you listening to him every minute of your life? Does the word matter to you? Does it speak to you? Does this change the way you're going to live and view the word of God? Are you prepared now in seeing his majesty in his glory to follow him at whatever cost? The disciples now, are they ready to follow Jesus to Jerusalem? That's where he's headed. Everything now is back downhill. Jesus also shows in a dramatic way that cross bearers, those who are ready, those who pick up their cross, will be glory receivers. The goal isn't the cross. The cross is the path to the goal. The goal, beloved, is the glory of God. Let me say that again. The goal isn't the cross. The cross is the path to the goal. That's our path. That was Jesus' path. The firstborn among the dead. But the goal ultimately is the glory of God forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you for your word revealed, for your majesty. Lord God, may this word change us and stir in us, Lord. Use these seeds that are thrown out today, Lord, to grow and to become strong oak trees. Oh God, we long to give you glory. It's our chief end to give you glory. Lord, may we be courageous and fierce in picking up our cross and following you. But may we fear no darkness. Lord, for you overcome and you have reversed what happened on her mom. You've reversed it. That's redemption, God, and we love it and we praise it and we praise you for everything you've done. It's in the wonderful power of God Almighty, we pray. Amen. You probably know this this song. We're going to sing it joyfully and happily because it's the truth. It's called Ancient of Days. The one revealed on the mountain. i
beloved, hear the benediction. Go forth knowing who you are, sanctified by glory and fire in Christ. Go forward in strength and fear, no darkness, taking up your cross for the glory of God. It's in his name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And for those, we'll see you at 1 o'clock at the fountain.